Good morning, everybody. It's a good Saturday morning, not Sunday morning, so I'm happy about that and happy that um, you guys dragged yourself over here from uh, wherever you were last night. Um, so for some of you may not realize it is the next morning. And uh, I'm going to talk today about um, hardware hacking and the law. Um, I'm Jennifer Granick. I'm the Civil Liberties Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And my um, colleague Matt Zimmerman is here with me today, and he's going to um, talk about these issues as well. So I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction. I think you guys all know what EFF is, I hope. I see some people with our shirts on. Thank you very much. Um, and the kinds of work that we do at EFF. Um, you know, in this area having to do with computer security and coders and programmers and hackers and then also all of our free speech and intellectual property work and privacy work that we do. So um, if you have interest in EFF and you don't know about us, you can visit our website. And what I'm going to talk about today, this morning, is hardware hacking and um, the special kind of legal regimes that relate to hardware hacking. And I'm going to talk specifically about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the rulemaking that happens under the Copyright Act, and how EFF won exemptions from uh, enforcing that law against people who unlock or jailbreak their phones people who make non-commercial videos, and then I'll talk about, um, about um, Professor Halderman's security exemption that he won for looking at video games, just because I think that that's something that this community of people might be interested in. So why have a talk that's particularly about hardware hacking as opposed to other kinds of hacking? Well, increasingly devices have embedded software in them, um, so that you know now we have everything, not just smartphones, but calculators, e-readers, and even cameras that have software in it. And the um, hacking that involves accessing embedded software raises special issues under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is this crazy law that we'll discuss in detail. So there's these particular DMCA issues, but one of the um, basic things that relates to what your rights are with regards to hacking or reverse engineering embedded software are um, terms of service. And so I'm going to turn it over to Matt for a while to talk about terms of service and EULAs and um, what the law is there and how it affects your rights with regards to manipulating pieces of software. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so to understand kind of the lay of the land, uh, to, to figure out your uh, potential liability uh, for hardware hacking and other related kind of uh, hacking activities. Uh, we have to understand the role that the use of end user license agreements, private contract, uh, terms of service play uh, into the, the potential liability realm. Uh, and uh, there, there have been a series of cases over the past few years that many of you have probably heard about uh, to some extent or another that really does kind of inform how we're, how we're you know, watching these issues uh, go forward and, and kind of mapping what, what direction, that, that what, what path it follows. Um, the first is the, the Lori Drew case um, that, again, is probably the, the most high profile of, of these cases. And the case had to do with uh, a woman who uh, put, a, put together a fake MySpace page uh, saying that she was a, a teenage boy who then entered into communications with the, the neighbor uh, girl, pretended to be someone who was interested uh, in this girl and kind of strung her along for a very long time and then turned on her and said that she was an awful person. And it, it's, a really, it's a really tragic story. The, the, the girl, uh, uh, in this case, ended up committing suicide. And the authorities were left with this kind of Bad, bad situation from their standpoint of not really having a, a legal regime, a, a, a law to apply to the to the situation. Nothing really kind of fits squarely. So someone had the the, the clever idea of using uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, which uh, limits uh, your ability to gain unauthorized access to remote computing networks. And so the theory was that because the MySpace Terms of Service banned uh, what 
what this woman did, uh, creating a fake profile, including uh, fake information, uh, including age information, that not only was that a violation of the terms of service, but that's actually a crime. Uh, and you can go to jail for that. Um, a jury convicted her uh, on, on this claim. Um, clearly, she was not a very sympathetic uh, figure. Uh, at the end of the day, the judge did what we think was the, was the right thing and ended up overturning that conviction, saying that, no, you, can, you know, this is not what the CFAA was created to do. It was more, it was about, you know, more, more you know, hardware-specific uh, you know, uh, hacking crimes, not a, a way to turn this kind of private agreement between, uh, you know, private individuals into a way to impose, to impose criminal liability. Um, but that, that theory did kind of, has ca kind of caught on and given, given others, uh, in, especially in law enforcement, this bright idea um, that that's, that's a way that we can, can get after people who are, who are violating uh, terms of service. Another case that we worked on is, uh, the second one up there is this, the, the Calixti case, uh, which had to do with a Boston College student who was uh, accused of sending emails on the Boston College uh, listserv uh, outing his roommate. The students had had a, a falling out, uh, apparently, and they suspected him of of, of sending these emails. Um, I, I, this isn't directly on point, but I, I thought I would mention at least a couple of the things that are in the uh, in the uh, statement of probable cause that you that you might find interesting. Is these are these are bits of information that uh, given to the judge to let him so that the judge could decide whether there was probable cause that he might have committed this so-called crime. Um, a couple of things in there. Uh, Mr. Clixty was quote a computer science major who was considered a master of the trade among his peers. Clearly, you know you know, notorious behavior, uh, that Calixti had a reputation as a, quote, hacker, uh, that it is not, un that it is, quote, not uncommon for Mr. Calixti to appear with unknown laptop computers, which he says that are given to him by Boston College field testing, or, or that he is, quote, fixing, unquote, for other students, and that he, my favorite, that he uses two different operating systems to hide his illegal activities. One, one, is, the regular, one is the regular BC operating system, and the other is a black screen with white font, which he uses prompt commands on. So, <laughs> you know, so clearly. For those of you who are in the probable cause talk yesterday, now you know. <laughs> it's, you know, they had him dead to rights, so. Um, so they, it, was the, it was the same theory. Um, you know, a similar one to the, the Lori Drew case, um, go through all of that information in the probable cause statement and the theory was, well, there's some, there's some terms of service that he must have violated. They didn't, they didn't quite mention what it was and it could have been, say, the, the Yahoo terms of service that you, you know, can't use it for harassing purposes. And what they actually, what the police actually said when they ended up briefing this was like, well, at the time we sought the warrant, there, it was pretty reasonable to think that there was a, a terms of service somewhere that would have that would have barred this, and it probably would have, you know, violated violated that. Um, uh, we ended up taking that to the the Massachusetts Supreme Court, and they and the court thankfully ruled ruled in our favor. So it was kind of scaling back uh, that you know, that attempt to, to use the terms of service as a, uh, as a theory in that way. Um, there are two more recent cases uh, that have, have really given, given some momentum to this effort to, to discourage people from using this, using this theory. Uh, one is a U.S. versus uh, Lawson, uh, which is a case that we filed an amicus brief in uh, a few weeks ago, uh, has to do with uh, a ticket master uh, and individuals using automated uh, efforts to purchase tickets from Ticketmaster in violation of their terms of service. Again, the government's position is that well, you're, you know, violating the terms of service. This is clearly not. It's clearly not a, a tort. It's not a private a, a civil issue. It's actually a crime that you could that you could do time for. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, the Facebook versus Power case, uh, similar technology, uh, Power developed a, a tool to aggregate to allow people to aggregate information across social networking sites. Uh, Facebook didn't like that uh, and uh, tried to raise the same kind of uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, theory. Uh, just last week, uh, the court issued uh, a ruling saying that no, that that doesn't fly. That's not what the statute was was intended for. Um, this is not what author unauthorized use meant uh, under under the statute. So so it seems like the law is at least moving in a in a good direction uh, on this point, even though con people continue to to try to use this theory. Um, there there one aspect of the 
the, of both the Lawson and the Facebook cases that still raise some concerns, and that's the uh, that it ties into what I've been talking about um, already, and that is um, to the extent that sites use. Uh, technological protection measures like CAPTCHAs or doing IP blocking and, the, and, the, and when you route around those efforts uh, to find, say, a way to automate a way around the CAPTCHAs or to change, you know, change your IP um, address when someone is clearly trying to block you specifically, um, how does that play into, this, into this, uh, this legal regime? And the court in the Facebook case left open the possibility that uh, that you know if you knew if you circumvented an IP block that could actually mean that you've gained unauthorized access to the system whereas just the generalized terms of service violation may not may not impose liability doing doing something else above and beyond that may may very well impose impose liability and that that issue is still still live in the in the Lawson case so um, so this all to come full circle all becomes important um, it's not just simply relevant for website uh, usage, it's, it, it implicates really what happens when someone slaps a terms of service on their product, um, not only their service, but their product. Their, you know, their, can, can someone add a, add a license agreement to their product saying that you know, you're not allowed to you know, do X, Y, and Z, and can, can you not only find yourself in trouble when, if they sue you, but can you, can you also find yourself in jail? So I'd be interested just generally in what people think about that circumvention issue because we've tried to, you can see what we said about it in the Facebook case and in the uh, Lawson case where we discussed the questions of what kind of technological measures are when circumvented equal unauthorized access. Um, so, so these licensing issues really matter when you have hardware hacking because the software, the embedded software will come with some kind of license usually. And that um, license seeks to condition how much you can use the and what you can do with the software. And those licenses are generally considered to be enforceable even when they have terms that prohibit reverse engineering and those sorts of things. Um, and the licenses often will say that you're not the owner of the copy of the software, that the copy of the software is actually just lent to you and that um, the ownership rights remain with the remain with the company and all of that implicates what your rights to do um, security testing or reverse engineering are under the copyright law so I'm going to talk a bit about the copyright law about the MCA and uh, show you some of the problems with this law and then talk a bit about the rulemaking and how we got around some of these things so there's, when we talk about the DM, when we lawyers talk about the DMCA, usually we're talking about one of two provisions. There's the safe harbor provisions under Section 512, and there's the anti-circumvention provisions under Section 1201. And so I'm talking about the 1201 provisions, which are the ones that I think are so fascinating. And when Congress went through and um, passed this law, I think the idea behind it was that it was going to be a law that says that you cannot break technological locks that protect copyrighted works. And the idea was to, first of all, first and foremost, to prevent digital pri piracy of um, particularly DVDs and music and that sort of thing. Um, but also there's this idea that it enables new business models because um, companies can control the way you get to the work. So even when it has nothing to do with infringement necessarily, um, it, if you could have protection, legal protection for things like for, for different uh, technological protection measures, TPMs, you could have streaming or you could have leasing of music, digital music and that kind of thing. So. This, the law is structured to have two basic prohibitions. One is a prohibition against the act of circumvention, and the other is a prohibition against the distribution of tools which are used for circumvention. Um, and these are all terms of art under the statute, um, but I think you get the basic idea is that a technological protection measure, TPM, is something that controls access to the work. It doesn't control top copying. We're not talking about something that prevents infringement. We're talking about something that controls the way you use um, or access the work. People at this point usually raise their hand and they ask me, what's effectively mean in the terms of the statute? Effectively does not mean that it is, in fact, effective. It means, in effect, <laughs> that's what it's trying to do. So so obviously, I mean, I guess I kind of think that makes sense because if it were, if the t TPM were so effective, then probably it wouldn't be so darn easy to hack. Um, so the tools provision um, basically says that you cannot traffic and distribute tools that are primarily designed, valuable, or marketed for circumvention of a TPM that controls access to a copyrighted work. So, acts and tools. 
What kind of things are TPMs? And you guys can think of these, whether it's DVD encryption, code signing, obfuscation, maybe protocol encryption. There's a bunch of things that, are, that could potentially be TPMs. And then the question that courts look to when trying to decide if this is something that you are or are not allowed to circumvent is what effect does the TPM have? How does it govern the, the work? Uh, and the statute has a bunch of exceptions to it that are built into the statute. Uh, the three that I think are most relevant to what you guys do are the uh, exception for reverse engineering, the exception for security testing, and the exception for encryption research. I don't want to talk too, too much about the parameters of the exception, but I wanted to give you guys some uh, examples just of what the language of the statute is so you can see why it is that we, I, don't believe that the exceptions are enough, that they don't do enough for the kind, to protect the kind of research that, that people need to do. Um, and this is just, here's your example, this is the uh, exception for reverse engineering. And reverse engineering exception is only for interoperability. And you can see all these conditions on it. You have to lawfully get the copy. The sole purpose can be to analyze the elements that are necessary to achieve interoperability. And it cannot have previously been available to you. And, there, and then there can be no infringement. So you can see in the way that Congress has chosen to draft these that while you generally are allowed to reverse engineer. And reverse engineering is generally considered to be not a copyright infringement or justified under fair use or something like that. Here, when you're reverse engineering also is a circumvention of a TPM, the right gets very narrow and small. Um, you know, all these, like, all these factors condition it. Security testing exemption is similarly cabined. Um, it says that you can only do claim that exemption for testing that goes to a computer or computer system, um, and it has to be for good faith, and the owner or operator of the computer has to, you know, has to, to, to be the one that authorizes it. So, um, you know, it's very much this, this, this narrow cabined thing that you have to, that, that also controls where you can, or to whom you can give the information that you derive from the security testing. So basically, just to kind of sum up this slide, I think if you look at this, I went through the factor or went through all of the exemptions that are listed under the statute and tried to pull out some things that I think are factors that feed into the question of whether one of these exemption applies, just to give you a sort of a sense of it. Um, and I think that you know, it gives, it gives me, as somebody who represents researchers and reverse engineers, um, a, a real pause about how you condition or plan your research ahead of time if you are a person who's doing research on TPMs um, to make sure that you would fit in under one of the exceptions. And I think the conclusion that researchers um, like Professor Halderman came to is that the exceptions that are granted under the statute are simply not broad enough to cover the types of things that people want to do when they're when they're taking a look at, at, uh, at uh, various security issues. So you'll see when we talk about, the, uh, about Halderman's exemption request to the Copyright Office exactly um, that the Copyright Office agrees with him that, these, that the security testing exemption is not broad enough, but also disagreed that he gets an exemption anyway. So um, another one thing that I'll, that I'll also say is that as m much as the um, the exemptions might be so narrow for, for acts of circumvention, they're much more narrow even than that for tools. So if you are a person who is in the business of creating tools that circumvent TPMs, it's a good idea to talk to a lawyer ahead of time because it's very complicated um, and very narrow little path for, for when you're allowed to distribute tools. I'll just say one thing, tool, the tool provision is not about information, it's actually about tools, but it can be components of tools and so it's, sometimes unclear exactly how that, what that means for people who are trying to simply publish research papers. But generally, we like to think that uh, the tools provision doesn't impact speech or publication. That's just pure information. But if you try to communicate your ideas, as computer scientists so often do in code, then we have problems. Um, if you're interested just more generally in the DMCA, you can take a look at uh, our webpage. We publish a um, kind of a sum up every three years about, I think we do it every three years, or maybe it's every two years about the unintended consequences of the DMCA and the types of cases that have been um, filed in the interim period of time attacking things that we think are legitimate, um, legitimate research or legitimate efforts. 
So Congress put in um, some safeguards in order, because it recognized when it passed the DMCA that this was kind of new and people thought it would really screw up researchers and other sorts of legitimate um, free speech and um, fair use activities. So you, they said, okay, you can have this rulemaking and this should be the fail safe. Like the, con the, the Copyright Office can recommend and the Librarian of Congress can issue rules that exempt certain um, things. And basically, you define a class of copyrighted works, say what the technological protection measure is, and if you can show that it fits these statutory factors, including primarily that it doesn't enable any kind of infringement or anything like that, then maybe we'll grant you an exemption for that class of works. And it was in this rulemaking that we recently won the jailbreaking and the unlocking exception and, and the one for um, a non-commercial video. The rulemaking is super complicated in terms of the way that the procedure goes. And the burden on the um, proponent is really high. And then when you win the rulemaking, if, if you win, the exemption goes to acts of circumvention. It does not address tools. So that's a very important thing for people to remember. Um, the proponent has to show that for the class of works that you define, um, the DMCA has had or is likely to have an adverse effect on non-infringing use of that class of works. And um, w I participated in this rulemaking back in 2006 and got an exemption for phone unlocking. This is the class of works that I defined this year as being the one I wanted the exemption for, for phone unlocking. So the idea here being that you have a handset, it's locked to a certain network, and you want to change it. And um, some entities, including um, particularly TrackPhone, had filed lawsuits against people who were unlockers claiming that the unlocking violated Section 1201. Um, so how did that, how did it, um, you know, how did it violate 1201? The idea was that for, um, specifically, these lawsuits were about CDMA phones, and specifically for these phones, then when you altered or changed the lock and manipulated the values so that you could put your phone from Verizon to Sprint or some other network, whatever it was, um, that you were running the underlying software that makes the phone operate, and it's that underlying software which is the class of works. Um, and they, so, the, you know, so that's, that's what they argued. Now, where's the infringement there, right? Because this is the thing that I think is so interesting about hardware hacking that's different from a lot of the other copyright issues, which is that um, there's, you know, there's very often going to be some kind of lock or something that controls how you use the firmware, but there's nothing here whatsoever that has to do with infringement. We're not taking the software off the phone and distributing it on the Internet or anything like that. Where's the, where's the arguable infringement here? And um, what the... Uh, companies have said when they oppose our exemptions um, is that the infringement comes from your running the software in a way that we don't want you to run it. You're not entitled to do this under the licenses. So I'll show you this a little bit more with the jailbreaking, but you can see. So for the unlocking, we had clients. Our clients were phone recyclers, um, and we'd identified the copyright work as the software on the phone, and we pointed to the track phone lawsuits and said, look, there's actual harm. The DMCA is interfering here, and this is non-infringing activity. So hey, we won it in 2006. I was really happy and surprised then. And we won it again this year in the 2009 rulemaking. I know it's 2010. But the rules were supposed to come out in November, and we've been waiting since November for it to happen. So I'm pretty happy if the Copyright Office was going to be late that they issued the rules right before DEF CON. Because otherwise, all these slides would just be like a big question mark. Like, who knows what they're going to do? Um, but look at how they changed my exemption from what I had in 2006. They really, you know, they. I say they, they chopped the pinky off of it. Um, they limited it, not to all wireless handsets that you want to put on a different network, but only to used ones. And they put in this word solely that said the circumvention can be solely for the purpose of connecting to a different network. And the operator of the network has to agree, which I'm fine with that. Um, but the, the reason why I think they did this is because the exemption was opposed by CTIA and also by Virgin uh, Mobile uh, because those companies, Virgin and TrackPhone, they sell the handsets at a, with a subsidy at a, you know, at a loss and then they try to make up the loss by having people go month to month, you know, get the month to month service and what people were doing is that they were going to these big box stores and buying the track phones and the Virgin uh, mobile phones in bulk, unlocking them, and then reselling them for closer to their true value on the marketplace, um, and just you know pocketing the subsidy. And you know, 
for obvious reasons, Virgin and TrackPhone didn't like this. It interfered with their business model, which was you know, basically the razor, razor blade model. Um, then when we you know, litigated this and debated this in front of the Copyright Office, the Copyright Office guys were like, what do you have to say about that? And I was like, it's not a copyright problem. You know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it sounds bad, but it's not a copyright problem. It's a, you know, it's, this is their business model and, you know, they're going to have to figure it out. Maybe they have contract remedies. They have, you know, they can make the big box stores only sell one or two to a person at a time or whatever. And so what the, they clearly did this is to try to make sure that those bulk purchasers didn't enjoy the benefits of my exception. So, what can I say? Okay, so jailbreaking. So this is the one I think a lot of people were really interested in and which really blew my mind when they actually granted it. This is the class of works that we defined. So I just, do you guys see how like arcane and weird this whole rulemaking is? I mean, it's like this is a class of copyrighted works and we're sort of like trying to, the description has to be the description of a, of a type of software. So here's what we described it as. Um, it's programs that let you, um, let you run software applications if the software applications are lawfully obtained. So this is what we asked for and we tried to cabin it so that it was just going to be about interoperability because we wanted you know, the Copyright Office to like it and accept it. Um, and what are the copyrighted works that we're talking about with the iPhone? Well, there's the bootloader and then there's the iPhone operating system. And the um, question, I guess, was that we had to show, and this is one of these weird you know, political things about doing the rulemaking is in order to win, you have to show that the DMCA adversely impacts what you're doing, which means you have to say that it's unlawful under the DMCA, except you don't want to say that this thing that you think is important for people to be allowed to do is unlawful. So you have to kind of say, well, it's arguably unlawful, and so the DMCA poses this danger. And then on the other side, you have Apple coming in, and Apple wants to say, oh, you know, don't worry about the DMCA here. There's no harm or anything like that. But they don't want to say it's lawful. So they're in the same kind of catch-22s. So there's a little dance where, you know, everybody's kind of like suggesting that they believe the opposite of what they wish were true. Um, and so, uh, you know, basically, you know, Apple came in to the hearing and said, you know, we don't think that this exemption should be granted. We have engineered the iPhone very much so, so that we control access to both the bootloader and the operating system. And uh, they gave evidence in the hearing about the chain of trust and how, um, you know, basically when you boot up your iPhone, there's a um, cryptographic um, check on each level of the software to make sure that it is something that is approved by, by Apple. Um, and starting, you know, from the bootloader and then validating the operating system, which validates the applications, and that this chain of trust is their technological protection measure. Um, and so, you know, we said yes, okay, so now we have to show that there's something out there that is going to, um, that, you know, that circumvents this and that this circumvention is legitimate and is in danger. So we looked at and presented evidence about um, one of the jailbreak tools that's out there and how it works to circumvent the chain of trust or to basically circumvent the, the technological protection measure that Apple put on the, put on the phone. So. Um, this is basically how one of the jailbreaking tools work, and you can see that this is like it's in very interesting. It's a te you know it's a circumvention. So um, the question then at that point in the rulemaking for Apple was, well, they have to show that we don't fit in under the statutory uh, ex allowances for issuing exemptions because somehow or another we're we're violating copyright law and the the uh, you know the factors aren't met and this gets to um, what the point that Matt was trying to make about terms of service and EULAs and licenses one of the things that they said is well you know when you modify the copy of the bootloader lo that's on sitting there on your phone you have created a derivative work and that is infringing so that's thing number one that they said thing number two is say is that um, when you have the operating system or software on your phone and we issue it to you under a license, you are not necessarily the owner of that piece of software. You're a licensee. 
And so owners of software have certain rights under Section 117 of the Copyright Act um, to do adaptations to enable them to, to enable you to make your software interoperable with other pieces of software. If you're not an owner, you don't get the Section 117 rights. So they said, well, you, there's no rights of ad adaptation here that apply. And so when you do adaptations, it's infringement. Um, they also said that the uh, infringement happened from you know, other people, not just the people that, who were the owners of the iPhones who wanted to jailbreak them. That the people who developed the tools were infringing Apple's software and Apple's copyrights, and that um, people who made independent applications might also be in, infringing as well, or at least in violation of their software agreements, whether it be the SDK license or you know the SDK agreement or, or other pieces of software licenses. So we we had big argument about this um, in the in the before the Copyright Office. And um, it was really interesting how the Copyright Office decided to deal with these very difficult, uh, the very difficult copyright issues. And basically what the Copyright Office said was, um, we've looked at all the case law surrounding when you're a licensee and when you're an owner of a piece of software. And we've looked at the cases about when the Section 117 adaptation rights applies and when it doesn't. And what we've decided is that the cases are unclear. We don't know. Yes, we're the Copyright Office, but we don't know, <laughs> you know what the issue is here. So instead of resolving that problem, we are going to say that either it's non, um, you know, we're going to say that we think that, you know, to the extent that in some cases the 117 or fair use right applies, or it's not infringing, um, we think that this is going to be okay, and we just they just sort of like moved beyond that issue. So I just thought it was really interesting that they recognized and sort of acknowledged the fact that the cases that we have to grapple with every day in order to help determine what people's adaptation and fair use rights are, are just like all over the map. Nobody really knows what the answer is there. Um, and that they nonetheless said, you know, this isn't going to be infringing because, um, because you're just running your own applications on the phone. And so they issued the rule, and here's the language that they, that they chose to use. Um, you know, my, this, I think, was just so unexpected. Um, and it, great for people who have iPhones and who want to jailbreak them and run their own applications. I think it's, um, you know, as we, what we believe at EFF is you bought it, you own it, it's your phone, you can do what you want with it. Um, but the other thing that I think is so great about this is how this promotes innovation in that market for applications. So there's lots of um, independent app stores out there now that are starting up. And I also think that um, we've, what we've seen in the uh, iPhone smartphone platform is that really interesting applications get their foothold in the marketplace um, having been on the jailbroken platform, like whether it's tethering or VoIP or something like that. And then once they are adopted by people and there's like real market for it, there's pressure for it to be adopted by the App Store for the rest of us who haven't jailbroken our phones. So I think this is really, you know, a great thing for not just for, you know, the kind of like, it's mine and I can hack it if I want to, but also for the marketplace for apps for those of us who are like me, <laughs> who haven't jailbroken their phone and, and, and don't know how, but want there to be a real wide variety of applications out there. Um, I mostly think of tethering and VoIP and not the fart ones, but whatever you like, it's fine, because you know, that's what capitalism's all about. I want to mention um, the other EFF exemption that we won. This, I think, is mind-blowing, really, because whoever thought they'd do anything good for people who want to make fair use of DVDs, we asked for uh, an exemption for um, non-commercial videos, basically like mashup videos that people create from ripping DVDs and then put up on YouTube or other distribution sites. There were film professors who had um, basically blazed the way for this. So Pete DeSherney, a film professor in 2006, had asked for an exemption to allow professors to circumvent CSS on DVDs so they could take clips of DVDs and show them in their film class. And he presented evidence to the Copyright Office in 2006 that the alternative there was, let's say you were having a class about, oh, I don't know, surveillance in the movies. Instead of being able to rip the DVD and take little chunks of the films to show them to people, you would have to have like an array of DVDs DVD players all queued up and everything to play, one for each movie that you wanted to play the clip on in order for your class to go smoothly at all. And the Copyright Office was like, yeah, actually that does sound kind of bad. So that was sort of like a, 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 
an, a, an in really for them to understand that there are lots of fair use reasons, not just for film professors and for criticism and commentary and all of that stuff, but a lot of fair use reasons, documentary filmmaking and non-commercial mashup type of videos, why we should be able to circumvent CSS. Um, so they issued this rule. I almost fell on the floor, but it's awesome. So you know, for those of you, whether you're somebody who makes these or somebody who, um, somebody who watches them, it's awesome. I want to talk um, a little bit about um, Alex Halderman's exemption that he asked for um, with the assistance of the clinic at the University of Colorado and, and Paul Ohm's students there. Um, Alex had asked for, you know, he um, has done a lot of research on um, TPMs that are on CDs and that sort of thing. He was the one who found the, the, the Sony root kit and he had done research on other TPMs as well and asked that um, security researchers like himself be allowed to circumvent these measures in order to um, find out what whether these, uh, whether these access control measures compromise the security of computers more generally and also to figure out whether there was in fact one of these one of these types of uh, Backdoor, backdoor TPMs on any any particular sort of media, and um, this is the basically the language that he had asked for. Um, the works, the, the 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 works he asked for were video games, and then also more general literary works like sound and AV recordings. And he said, "Look, you know, we actually can't do the research that we want to do because of this." And one of the things that the other side said was, "Well, hey, you have a security testing exemption." So what's the problem? There's a, Congress has already given you an exemption for security testing. So if you recollect back when I was talking about the security exemption, that is only for computers, testing on computers. And this isn't testing on computers. This is testing on DVDs and CD-ROMs and those sorts of things. So it doesn't apply. This is just the security testing exemption is too narrow. Um, and then, of course, the argument there is, well, that's what Congress wanted. It didn't want anything broader, so don't give them the exemption. And you know, the battle goes on. What the um, Copyright Office eventually recommended um, was that the exemption be granted for um, looking at TPMs that control video games, but not for the broader class of AV and um, musical works. And they rejected the full exemption because they said that Halderman had not made a factual record that there was going to be real harm in the next you know, three years. So this, this is another weird thing about the rulemaking is you've got to show that there's likely to be harm in the next three years, which is like what's going to happen you know, based on just what happened before. And he, in the, um, in the evidence that he presented, that they were able to present, looked to secure ROM and the few things that were out there, but those were about video games and not about this broader work. So they said, well, you haven't shown it. Um, I bring this up, I guess, I just want to point out, like a lot of people ask me when we talk about the jailbreaking exemption, does this mean I can also jailbreak my iPad? And the answer to that is no, because iPad didn't exist when we asked for the exemption, so we didn't frame the class of works as being those that cover the iPad we didn't know. Um, and it's the same thing sort of here. You've got to look at what happened in the three years prior and then project what might happen in the next three years, and you just don't know. And if you try to be more broad and expansive about what might happen, then the Copyright Office rejects your exemption because you didn't have factual evidence in the record. This is the, the text of the exemption that, uh, that the Copyright Office did issue for video games. So you can see the same kind of very cabined, narrow, stuff that, that, you know, that we talked about before. Um, it's got to be used that primarily is better than the solely in my exemption, but you can see that try to, try to narrow it and keep it small. Okay, I am going to, that, I'm going to take a few questions here and then I know there may be more questions and we'll be in room 111 across the way, but uh, if people have questions, I'll repeat them. Yeah, right over here. What is good faith testing? What's good faith testing when it comes to security? There's like, if I ask him that question, he's not admitting he doesn't know. <laughs> he wants to know what other people think. It's a great question. You know, this idea that somehow some people have good faith and some people don't have good faith. And what do you look to? Is it like, you know, people who have PhDs are somehow in good faith, but people who are independent or self-taught somehow are not? Like, what is, the, what is the atmospherics that go to good faith? And this is one of the things that is interesting as a, um, 
you know, not as a, as a theoretical lawyer, but as an advocate in this field, is all the stuff that goes around it that helps you try to convince, you know, a court or somebody that, that something's good faith, right? So, I, I mean, I guess that's a long way of saying, I don't know. Five minutes? Okay. Yeah. Does full disclosure mean you're not good faith? You know, the disclosure comes, you know, if you look at the exemptions, the exemptions, some of the exemptions are conditioned, or exceptions are conditioned on you're using the information solely to help the owner. So if you make full disclosure and it's not solely to help the owner, then that could be under the statute something that removes from you the ability to claim the exemption. Um, not in every case, because each exemption is different, but, but you know, that it's, it's an issue there. I don't think Congress meant to be taking a position in the full disclosure versus limited disclosure debate, um, but it, it's, it's a factor. It's definitely a factor. And for those of you, if anybody's in the audience who's ever come to talk to me about disclosure issues, you know what I always say, which is that the disclosure is legitimate, but the way you do it is going to condition what's going to happen just because it's, you know, how people feel about you. And that those sort of atmospherics, when you're operating in a legal regime, that's kind of fuzzy really matter. So, uh, yes, here on the aisle. What's used when you talk about used handset? And my answer to this question is the same as my answer to the last question. I don't know. I mean, I guess I know what's definitely used. I think that they just put it in there and figured, let track phone and Virgin Mobile litigate it. You know? Yes, over there. Yeah, so if you put tethering software or some other unapproved app on your phone, can they turn off your network access? And the answer to that's yes, conditioned just on whatever your, your service contract is, right? Um, because the contract probably lets them do whatever they want. And then you have a cause against them for, you know, contract violation or something like that. I mean, they preserve for themselves as network operators all of those, all of those rights. Um, but, you know, there's some difference of interest between AT&T and, and, and Apple here. But, and I haven't heard of them doing that. What I have heard more of what we hear is that Apple will issue a software update that breaks the jailbreak. Or, you know, as everybody's always afraid, we'll, we'll brick the phone. So that's the thing that we really worry about. And then there's all sorts of warranty issues where they could incur liability for intentionally doing something like that. Okay, I'm going to look over here on this side of the room. Any questions? Yes, this gentleman here in the front. So you're, you're talking about when you do full disclosure, somehow issuing it with a, with a click wrap license that says, I promise not to sue, I waive my right to sue, or something like that? It says that you're going to use it in good faith for the intention of the end use. Oh, I see. To condition the release of the information through a toss on um, saying that you're not going to use it for bad purposes, but for good. And then the, the, the security researcher can say, look, I didn't you know, distribute it in a bad way because I had this toss on it. Do you have a thought about that? It's too, you know. <laughs> if you do that, and then let me know so we can see if it works or not. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it, I don't think it can hurt. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to think about that. So I, usually what I say with stuff like this is I say, um, you know, we can try to be crafty, but it doesn't always work as well as, as, we, would, as we would like. So I'm going to take this person here, and then I'll come to you and say, yeah. Say, can you say again? Like phones put out by certain carriers that have a bunch of bloatware. For instance, your phone at the window of the window 6.1 or the line or something like that. Another version of the window 6.1 where you might really need to remove all the bloatware that carriers want. Yeah, if you're just deleting, deleting programs you don't want. And you, are you saying you have to circumvent some technological measure to delete the software off the phone? Huh. I got to think about that. I mean, the exemption certainly doesn't isn't about that particular thing. See, this is really good because you know the rulemaking is actually going to start up again in like about a year and a half or so, and we're going to ask for more. So you know, I, I, you, if you can email me about this, I'd be very interested in in, in thinking about it, and then also thinking about whether we want to ask for an exemption for it. Yeah, thanks. This gentleman over here. Yeah. 
Yeah. His question was about EFF's work on terms of service and other kind of adhesion contracts and limiting, you know, what's allowed in there. Do you want to take that, Matt? Okay, um, so we have a lot of stuff we do on this involving trying to say that you cannot waive reverse engineering rights or other kinds of fair use rights through these click-through agreements. We have our work we do on um, the computer crime area that Matt talked about involving um, saying that terms of service can't be enforced as a matter of criminal law. And um, we have a bunch of um, like sort of the unconscionability type work we do on other terms of service issues. So the thing with terms of service is a question of is it a contract? And that's like the, the first thing is about formation. And then the second part is about substance. The second attack is on substance and is the substance of the contract unconscionable or otherwise unenforceable for some reason. So we do a lot of stuff on that because exactly the reason you say these are contracts of adhesion. So that's all the questions that we can take here. We're going to be in room 111. And I want to thank you all for coming um, at this ungodly early hour and uh, talking about this interesting topic. All right, also, if you are leaving and you do not have to, please go out the back door, not out the side doors. It's incredibly crowded out there for the ATM talk. And if you expect it to get in there, don't bother. <laughs>